of Maine. I go up to Maine at least once or twice a year uh, and do a meat cutting school up there as, in conjunction with our meat cutting school here in Kentucky. And the one thing I've started noticing happening in the in the last few years when I've been up at UMaine is the number of off the grid people and the do it yourselfers that are interested in this type of thing. Now, as a side note, uh, maybe it's just me, but if I'm going to live off the grid, Maine may not be my my first choice of places to live off the grid. But we're starting to see more and more folks that are interested in making processed meats and sausages more specifically here in Kentucky as well, as we're starting to see some of that uh, kind of what's happening in Maine filtered down to us as as well. Uh, so just to get started here, you know, we talk about sausage, this is why we're here. Um, sausage is kind of a really neat thing that a lot of meat processors that have their own retail stores, they utilize sausage as a way of adding value to their uh, company. And I did a little bit of research and talked with some colleagues of mine throughout the uh, throughout the U.S. That are, that are also meat specialists in other states as well that have a very heavy processed meats component to their to their uh, uh, local industry there. And, and a lot of these processors that utilize processed meats and sausages and things like that can add anywhere to 35 to 50 percent extra revenue to their sales uh, by by adding these kind of processed meats as snack sticks, breakfast sausages, bratwurst and things like that uh, to their, their their case. But you got to realize there's and we're going to go over this. Uh, there's many different types of sausage. And usually when you say the word sausage, the first thing you think of is ground pork and adding seasoning to ground pork, but we can make sausage out of anything, anything. And the best way uh, to express this, and I tell my students this in, uh, here on campus, is majority of what you see in your lunch meat pegboard at your local grocery store, those are considered sausages. And you say, well, th this, that doesn't make sense. But as we go through these different types of sausages, you'll see what I'm getting at as well. This is the cool thing about being a meat scientist is you get to travel a lot. And this is a little bit of a dated picture. This is from about 10 years ago at the uh, at Minnesota, the Minnesota Meat Processors Convention up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I definitely earned my my bones going up to uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota in the first part of February. It was really cold and really snowy, but you can see Minnesota uh, is one of those states that, that is heavily into processed meats. And this was their competition that they had at their, their annual convention. And you can see the different types of sausages that they make. And, and they entered into, into the contest. This one with these kind of black dots in the middle here, right here, this is actually a blueberry wild rice summer sausage. All right. And you think, well, that sounds odd. Yeah, it tasted odd too. I remember that one specifically. Um, here's a look at some other different kind of summer sausages that uh, that folks have made over the years. This one back here in the back corner, I remember this one specifically. They used uh, uh, habanero peppers in there as well. They dried habanero pepper. Uh, so they you know do a variety of those different types of sausage as well. One thing I've learned about uh, the uh, uh, our friends up there in the north there in Minnesota, they they grow a lot of wild rice, and so wild rice got incorporated into um, a lot of their sausages up there. And you can see that in this class as well. And then there's some people that really get excited and let their imaginations run wild, sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a not so good way. Uh, this actually is a little bit of a take on a, on a head cheese where they created a gelatin with pork scraps and put it in a bunk, uh, cake loaf with olives. Um, I wasn't brave enough to try this one. Uh, I don't think it won for obvious reasons, but it is kind of interesting to see how people let their imaginations go wild and they create different products. And that's which is kind of always neat to, to uh, go to these processed meat shows and uh, experience the different things that processors do to try to add a little bit more value to their, their products. Uh, and so here's a really fun extension question. If uh, 
any of you have ever had me for a uh, as a as a professor I always I always couch my classes you know what is the extension question of the day and here's a, a common one I get is why is this ingredient in my sausage what is the purpose of it and I've heard some wild ones over the years but let's go over some basic ingredients of why these products are in here. When you think of ingredient labels, you know, some people are, are, are habitual ingredient label readers. And one thing you realize is that we we list things on ingredient level uh, ingredient label from the most prominent uh, ingredient in there to the least prominent ingredient in there. And the one thing that we work with folks in the Food Systems Innovation Center when they, uh, they bring us a label is, you can see down here in this example, this is actually a, a ingredient label for a beef jerky. And so they use Worcestershire sauce. Yes, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, in, their, in their marinade. And so you just cannot simply put Worcestershire sauce in there. You have to list out the ingredients that are inside that sauce as well. Uh, here's soy sauce and list out those ingredients in there as well. So in reality, there's only about a half dozen ingredients that went to make this beef jerky, but you can see it looks like a bigger ingredient label because of the, the, some of the marinades that they use in there. You had to tease those out as well. Now, the other thing that uh, we have in this country is allergens. All right. There are a lot of people that are allergic to uh, a lot of different foods, those allergens have to be declared on the label. They either have to be bolded or brought out so that people who have food allergies uh, can can read those labels and make sure they're not, they're not going to cause a reaction. Vast majority of our food allergies are protein based, although we're starting to see more and more other allergies that are not related to proteins. But uh, you know, this may be a little bit dated, and some of my colleagues on here could probably tell me if this number is correct. But we have over 160 different foods that are in the allergen list that cause a reaction. All right, they cause a reaction, and I pulled out uh, about the most common allergens that you see on an ingredients label: milk, eggs, fish. You know, uh, shellfish is a, is one. Tree nuts. All right, yes. Peanut has nut in the name. It's not a tree nut, it's a legume, but we have a lot of people that are allergic to peanuts, wheat, uh, soybeans, and so on. And so what we're trying to avoid is, is people that have these uh, these allergen, allergies to certain ingredients in foods or certain foods in general, that they don't have a reaction, this anaphylactic shock that they go into. There. You can see this little baby here, uh, she's smiling, looks bright and happy there, but my goodness gracious, she just that just looks uncomfortable as can be looking at that uh, little baby there with that aller allergy reaction there as well. Hopefully, when you're looking at an ingredient label and it's for a sausage, meat is going to be the very first ingredient on the list. Chances are you're going to see salt somewhere right up there, either the second, third, or fourth ingredient. Go this way. And when it comes to salt, uh we think of salt as being a flavor enhancer, something that we add to our food to bring those, those flavors out. But in sausage making, salt not only helps us with that, bringing the ingredients out, it's also what we refer to as a functional ingredient as well. And so if you've ever mixed salt into like maybe hamburger, you know, you're making a type of sausage when you're, if you wanted to make a one comes to mind, the, the onion soup mix hamburgers, you know, you mix that and it's got salt in there. You start noticing that the, the meat gets really, really, really sticky. That's that salt in there. And it's 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 unfolding those proteins in, a, in layman's terms and is making those proteins sticky so that they'll bind together. And when I'm making a sausage, I want my meat to bind together. Now, granted, there are some sausages like a Mexican style chorizo where I add salt, but I'm not adding salt as a functional ingredient. I'm adding it as a flavor enhancer. So I've got to add salt in a Mexican style chorizo at the very end and just mix it enough to incorporate that salt in there because I don't want my Mexican style chorizo to bind together. I want to, I want to be able to chop it up uh, for that kind of stuff. So there are certain sausages that you, uh, you will, you will find that where salt is not a functional ingredient, actually is a flavor enhancer. 
Uh, we also know that we add salt because, you know, a lot of bacteria don't like salt. Um, and so we add it in there as well. It aids in, in water removal. You're going to see uh, uh, some of these uh, sausages in here where I need to lower the amount of water in there. And salt is very important in that, especially for those that here in Kentucky, we are in the, the heart of the country hams. And that's one of the things that I cure country hams with is salt because salt changes the osmotic pressure and allows that water to be removed as well. Now, in these products, we usually typically around 2% is what we utilize. Now, it's it's interesting because uh, it's kind of a neat little food science thing to do is, is the, it kind of determine people's uh, ability to taste salt. What, how much salt do I add to where they can taste salt? And some folks can go above 2% and not taste it. Others, well below 2% can taste it. And so usually if you see salt, it's followed by some sort of sweetener on the ingredients label. And a lot of times that we add that sweetener is a way of counteracting that harsh flavor that we get from salt. So as a way of kind of sweetening things up. And this could be as simple as sugar, either brown sugar or white sugar. <clears throat> You'll see corn syrup in there, corn syrup solids. Which that's gonna, that corn syrup solid is going to play an important role uh, later on in some of the sausages that we're talking about. Dextrose, fructose are often added in there. You'll see some uh, sausages that have maple uh, syrup. Honey's another one. So any type of sweetener we're going to add to that to help kind of counteract that that harsh flavor of salt. And the other thing, the cool thing that that uh, these sweeteners do is we like to have that kind of surface browning. And those guys do that. That's that Maillard reaction happening in real time right in front of you. But when we get into making some of these fermented sausages, and you'll understand what that means here in a few minutes, um, the sweetener that I add to that is also going to be uh, supplying the bacteria that I'm adding to our culture. Uh, like I said, we'll talk about it. Gives them a source of energy. Those bacteria will consume that and produce lactic acid, which is an important flavor component of those, those sausages as well. So people have all kinds of fun uh, with uh, counteracting that harsh flavor salt by adding some sort of sweetener to it as well. This uh, product right here mainly plays a role in uh, further processed meats like bacons and hams, but you do see it sometimes in uh, some sausages, and that's phosphates. Uh, phosphates, there's a variety of them out there, sodium phosphate, tripolyphosphate. And there's a bunch of them out there. And the reason why we add phosphates is it increases our water holding capacity. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, products that you see sometimes when you buy chicken and it says enhanced with, okay? Uh, and what it does is it protects us from overcooking. Uh, and, and, and again, unless you're using a, a, and you know some sort of expensive bottled water, adding water is cheap, is a cheap way of adding weight to your product. And so that's the main reason why you're going to see sodium phosphates in some of these, uh, uh, especially the processed meats, uh, for the processed meats and some of the some of the more advanced sausages, you'll see that in there as well. The government, the USDA tells us I can't add more than a half of a percent. This really uh, governs itself because if we get the closer we get to that half percent there, the more of a soapy flavor that uh, that phosphate's going to give to that sausage so it, it really governs itself uh on the on these things and if you're using this and you're making a brine for a ham or a bacon or something like that phosphate doesn't really like to dissolve very easily in water so a lot of folks will will add their phosphate into their brines first and mix and mix and mix. And about the time you think you got it dissolved, you let the water settle and you see the, the phosphate kind of cascading down to the bottom. I've even uh, seen some folks utilize, lack of a better description, like a trolley motor that you'd see on a boat to mix things up because it is a tough one to get get into a solution. So if you're, you're making a brine and you're experimenting with this, make sure you get that phosphate added first and get it thoroughly mixed before you add any of your other brine ingredients. Um, we live in a society to where uh, it's very global and we want to be able to, to ship products 
and into a variety of different locations that may be hundreds of miles away from us, time zones away from us. And we want to make sure that those products uh, get there and they look just as fresh on day five as they did on day one. And so this is where antioxidants come into play. And usually these, these are kind of bolded uh, on the front label. You'll see it. Johnsonville Bratwurst comes to mind where you see that. And here's a variety of, of, uh, of uh, antioxidants that are used in meat products. And sometimes they're even stacked together where you'll see not only one of these being used, but two of these guys being used as well. And even the more natural ones like the tocopherols, like vitamin E, gets used as well. And you can see in the picture here, this sausage uh, down here looks bright, looks fresh. It's, you know, looks really appealing to a consumer in the bottom picture here, this is considerably, made considerably uh, longer than this one was. This was only about 24 hours after being made without using an antioxidant. So you can see why uh, those antioxidants are used in, in, a, in a variety of sausages, uh, especially when we get into the bratwurst. Uh, nitrites, this is an extremely controversial ingredient. Uh, it has come in short supply uh, recently because of, uh, 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 as, the, as, our, as our market gets more global, uh, a lot of these products are getting a little bit more challenging to get a hold of as, as, as the suppliers adjust to it. Uh, this is one that uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to blame it on the uh, pandemic like everything else gets blamed on the pandemic for being in short supply. This is just one of those things where as more and more countries become uh, self-sufficient and they start making these products, it, it puts a little bit of strain on there. But nitrites is kind of controversial. And there's a main reason why we add nitrites. It's for this guy right here, Clostridium botulinum, which is the main pathogen that causes botulism. The cool thing about this guy is it has some side effects that work in our favor here. So we add it to control this guy, but we get a flavor, that cured meat flavor that we like so much comes from these nitrites. And it also creates that cured meat color, all right, that kind of bright pink color that we like so much. Most everybody in the industry uses, utilizes sodium nitrite. Uh, you'll see it uh, commercially. It's called Preg Powder or Instacure. Um, there's also one out there called potassium nitrite. It's not used very often, mainly because it gives a kind of a metallic flavor. It's not the, the desired flavor we want. Now you see, we got nitrite and nitrate. Uh, nitrates are what we use in dry cured meats, whether that's a charcuterie product or a country ham. And the nitrates by the bacteria on the surface will shift nitrate to a nitrite. It's a little bit slower reaction there is what we're looking for in those products. And I said these guys are very uh, controversial and it goes back to a study done in the 70s. So any of you that are baby boomers or Gen Xers like me will remember uh, there was an artificial sweetener called saccharin. And this was this was all kind of rolled up in the same study from MIT, where uh, you eat this product, it was going to cause cancer. And you remember, I forget the name of the bill, but uh, there was a bill in the 60s that said we cannot add any carcinogenic products to our foods, not ever dreaming we'd ever be able to measure things down to the parts per million and the parts per trillion. But just like anything else, when folks started to take that MIT study and they started adding a little bit of know-how to it and, and scratching out the actual concentrations, the amount of nitrite that they were giving these mice and causing cancer is the equivalent of eating about 40 pounds of bacon a day. And I can tell you right now, if you're eating 40 pounds of bacon a day, you're going to die of something else long before the cancer get a, gets a hold of you. So you're okay. And, and the trade-off for the nitrites versus, you know, the uh, cancer-causing agents versus the, the uh, botulism, it's, it's, again, we don't, we don't recommend it, but it is, it's not as bad as what people are making it out to be. And you can see here, the USDA highly, highly regulates the amount of, of nitrite that are in products. Um, but because of this study, we've seen over the last 15 years or so, probably even longer than that, maybe 20 years or so, 
an influx of the non-nitrite adder or no nitrite adder or uncured uh, products hitting the in the marketplace. And what they're doing to achieve the same kind of color and taste is they're adding vegetable powder, juices, extracts, uh, celery powder is a big one that folks use. Sea salt is another one. And all these, they, they all contain natural levels of nitrites in there. And if you look really closely at the labels on those products, you're going to see that, that there's a clause in those labels that says may contain products that have naturally occurring nitrites in there as well. Uh, this is always a fun one. I throw this one in there, sodium erythorbate. And uh, even long before the internet existed, there was an urban legend out there about sodium erythorbate as being made from earthworms. In fact, I used to work with this guy and when I was cutting meat grocery stores, he, he used to tell me that it's actually earthobate and that's the scientific name for earthworm. I, I knew at the time that wasn't, wasn't the case, but really what sodium erythorbate is, is it's a, a kind of a loose synthetic form of vitamin C and it's added to a lot of the brines that we use to make processed meats. And basically what it does is it cure, accelerates that curing process to and I, I cut this out. Uh, I didn't add the actual scientific stuff in there, but to create that that kind of pink color we see in the ham down there, it accelerates that process. That it happens a lot faster. It also helps stabilize our color as well. But and I throw that in there just because the fun of it is. Uh, we think a lot of these urban legends were started by the internet. Here's one that. I was dealing with, even when I was just a regular meat cutter uh, at, a, at a local grocery store in Illinois, where I grew up, where this came in a lot. And, this, and that was before the internet was, it was a thing. Other things that we see on an on ingredient label is flavorings and seasonings. And usually if you add... 2% or less of these guys, you don't have to really tease them out as much. You can just say the words flavorings and seasonings. And, and as I was talking with the USDA uh, individual on these products, he said uh, on these ingredients, we said, well, part of the reason why they do that is number one, it's not worth labeling it out. Number two, you know, we know that some of these flavorings and seasonings are, are key components to a person's recipe, the, the flavor profile they're looking for. And as long as they keep them in these low levels, they don't have to declare them on there. They can just label them under flavorings and seasonings. And it's a way that they don't have to give away any of their trade secrets as well. There's other products that you see. These aren't used as much as they were back in the 70s and 80s as extenders and binders. And I throw this in there because this is kind of a fun thing to talk about is why would extenders and binders be used in these products? Well, you see stability, water holding capacity, Enhanced texture and flavor, reduced shrinkage, and so on and so forth. Reduced formulation costs. This is why if you're my age, all right, you're a Gen Xer like I am, you probably early on in your school career ate a school lunch with the soy burger. And that's where this comes from is a way of reducing formulation costs because we had high inflation back at that time. And school lunches were trying to reduce costs. And so you, you've seen a lot of these products uh, added in there as well. And the cool thing about that is, is, is we don't use very much of them anymore. They're still out there every once in a while. But they are a big thing overseas. And so this is, you know, the soy products are the most popular one. The flours, the grits, the concentrates, the, the isolates. Sometimes you see uh, labeled as textured vegetable protein. So that means it could be a variety of it, dried milk, solids in there, and so on. And these are once commonly used. And if you're if you're looking for those vegan vegetarian burgers, you know, like the Boca burgers, they were used with a lot of these products in there as well. Um, here's a fun one as well. Is we use this especially in like, you know, like bolognese or other type of lunch meats, uh, hot dogs. You always see this stuff in hot dogs. Always see it in uh, um, in bolognese as well as the mechanically deboned meat, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a kind of a, a bright pink toothpaste. And what this is is is, is designed this mechanically deboning process. What it's designed to do is to make sure we're getting every usable part, every usable piece of meat off that bone. And you could say, well, why can't you pay somebody's thing of the law of diminishing returns, where I'm going to pay somebody 
17, 18, 20 some odd dollars an hour to, to sit there and pick out 50 cents worth of meat. But I can run it through some technology and create, get that meat off of there and not have to pay somebody to do it. And that's what mechanically debone meat is, is essentially where you, lack of a better description, it's where you take the bone that has the meat attached to it, you put it on like a sieve and a plate comes down and presses it and squeezes the meat off the bone. And uh, and this is what it, what it looks like is is right here. And you see that used a lot of times in uh, hot dogs and bolognese. I can remember when I was in grad school at Missouri, uh, a place called Columbia Foods, where a vast majority of our Oscar Mayer hot dogs come from. Just great big what we call combos. A combo is a huge box that sits on top of a pallet, just full of this mechanically deboned meat in there. And so it's it's a it's a good way of of utilizing those ingredients as well. So those are some of the main ingredients that we use in in processed meats and sausage as well. And like I said earlier, you know this is one of our oldest preservation methods we have. So we we would cut the meat off the bone, we trim it up, all right, and we have these scraps kind of laying around. And so what ended up happening is people would grind them or mince them. And to add flavor to it, they use whatever seasonings or spices was available to them. And so the flavor of sausages became very, very regionalized, depending on whatever products and seasonings that they had available to them. And so now our world has gotten a lot smaller and we don't really think of some of these, although I'm going to show you one sausage that it's extremely regional. But again, these, these flavors became very regional, but as the world has gotten smaller, some of these sausages aren't as regional as we once had them to be. And again, I've said this earlier, when we think of the, we say the word sausage, we think of pork, but you can see down here, you can utilize anything, beef, pork, lamb, goat, water, buffalo, camel, elk, deer, uh, you know, anything that we can mince up and add seasoning to is essentially a sausage. At one point, I, I lost it on my move here from Missouri to Kentucky when I was done with grad school at Mizzou. I Somebody had given me a recipe to make lion sausage. I, I say lion as in the main L-I-O-N, uh, and I lost it. You know, And so it just basically reiterates the fact that we can make sausage out of anything and everything that we have. So I'm, I'm going to go from the the most common easiest type of sausage to make to some of the more complicated sausages to make. And if you're doing these at home, I mean, we're going to get down to the, some of the later ones. And these required a little bit of a skill set to do some of these sausage and make some of these sausages. But these at the very beginning are fairly simple to make. For example, a simple, fresh sausage. This is typically where we have ground meat. We're going to add seasoning to it, mix it, fresh sausage, all right? Fairly easy to make. You've probably done this in your kitchen and didn't even realize it. Like I said, the, the onion soup mix hamburgers, adding ranch dressing to your, uh, ran the powdered ranch dressing to your hamburgers. Kind of the same thing, kind of the same thing. Most common type we see out there, breakfast sausage, all right? Bratwurst, Italian sausage, the Mexican style chorizo that I talked about earlier, are all types of these fresh sausages. They're fairly easy to make. Now, we do have a subcategory of this fresh sausage, and it's the pre-rigger sausage, or more commonly referred to as the whole hog sausage. And this is where I've had some discussions with not only students, but other consumers as well, because they buy a tube of Purnell sausage or Tennessee Pride or Bob Evans, and there's usually a caption on there that says made with loins and tenderloins and hams and all that. And folks realize that those are usually expensive products to make in a sausage. How they can say that is they're using sows. They're using what we call spent sow. So a sow has reached the end of her reproduction life and she gets made into sausage. Uh, we sometimes use boars. We've got to be really careful with boars because boars have what we call a boar taint doesn't really affect the flavor very much, but we know that aroma is a big aspect of flavor and that boar aroma, um, it, it really can affect the, the perception of flavor. What's interesting about this, and it's, it's really kind of a, a fascinating thing about physiology, most men can't smell it. 
all women can smell that boar tank. I've, I can smell it. I, that must mean I'm more in touch with my inner woman. I don't know. Uh, but it's a very rank, nasty smell. And I can imagine if it bothers me, it must really bother a female in, uh, who is uh, smelling this product as well. But we can dilute those bores out and, and still make product out of those. And reason why we say this is a pre-rigger whole hog sausage is if you go down the road where I'm at, where we have Purnell sausage, they really don't have carcass coolers there. Why? Because they, as they're going through this conversion of muscle to meat, um, as soon as they pass inspection, they're getting the muscle stripped off of them and um, going through a grinder, having seasoning added to them and so on and so forth. That's why they call it pre-rigger sausage. That, that muscle hasn't had a chance to go into rigor. And so I remember one time I was at Purnell's and I saw this animal and, and at the end of the tour, they handed me a tube of sausage and said, this probably came from that animal you've seen. It's about 45 minutes later. And so they, they go through them uh, that fast. And so the vast majority of bratwurst and breakfast sausage fit into this, uh, this category, this whole hog uh, sausage. Reason why we do this, we get a better water holding capacity. We get a better seasoning uh, inclusion in there, more pronounced seasoning flavor, and makes the color last longer, gives me a more uh, appealing color as well. So that's a subcategory there, the, uh, that whole hog or pre-rigger sausage as well. Here's another example of a sausage that can be a little bit more regional, uh, is the unsmoked cooked sausage, all right? Or excuse me, let me try that again. I swear I know how to talk. The uncooked smoked sausage, you got my words backed up there. Uh, this is same thing as we previously talked about the fresh sausage category, but this is where we smoke it as adding flavor to it, but it's still an uncooked sausage. And so you can see down here in the bottom, these canvas bags. And the reason why I say this is pretty regional, I see this product a lot in Western Kentucky and a lot in Western Tennessee. So, and it really hasn't kind of bled and filtered uh, our way as well. So if you really want this uncooked smoked sausage, I, I would encourage you to, to make a day trip down to some of those areas down in, in the Western part of the state to, to get that kind of uh, what, what I would call a country style sausage. Met worse. It's not to be confused with what the, uh, Cincinnatians call the Met or a Met worst up there. This is another one of the traditional old world Met worst is that uncooked smoked sausage where we're smoking the sausage, but it's still uncooked. It's a cold smoke uh, to add flavor to it as well. And then we get into, as you see, we're getting a little bit more uh, challenging in the make here is the cooked and or smoked sausage. So they can be cooked or they can just be smoked, or they can be smoked and cooked. And, and most of them <clears throat> fit into the cooked sausage or the cooked and smoked sausage, okay? Uh, if they're just smoked, they kind of fit in the previous category. Um, liver sausage, summer sausage fits into this, uh, or excuse me, smoked sausage fits in this category. The modern version of the kielbasa, fits into this category that you see that alongside the uh, summer or smoked sausage, I'm sorry, I keep saying that for some weird reason. Uh, that smoked sausage you see in your, in your meat case there is the kielbasa or Polska kielbasa fits into this category. Now, a traditional old world kielbasa fits into the previous category of the uncooked smoked sausage. And one that a lot of folks really are not big into this one, it probably fits into another, ca another category as well as Braunschweiger, where we not only have pork, we have liver added to it as well. And um, I'll be honest with you, I've had I've had Braunschweiger that was really good, and I've had Braunschweiger that was really bad. And so it is kind of a personal preference type thing is there. Now, the semi-dried and the dried sausages. Now we're getting into a whole new skill set, all right? Uh, these guys, a lot of folks want to make these. You can see in that bottom picture there, some of you might call these charcuteries uh, or charcuterie type sausages. Um, this is a different skill set. And I'm very cautious when I hear people say, oh, I'm going to make this at home. 
Uh, you really need to understand what's happening here, all right? Uh, these are fermented sausages, all right? And some of the dried sausage are air dried, kind of like what you'd see with a country ham. Pepperoni, okay? If you have pepperoni sausage, that's a fermented sausage. Summer sausage, um, you know, Genoa salami, an old world Genoa salami fit into these fermented categories. Now we get into dried sausages, okay? Again, these take a little bit more know-how to make this, all right? This is where we want these products to be fermented. So if you remember when I went back and talked about um, the sweeteners and how some of those sweeteners we add that allow the bacteria a chance to, to eat that, those sweeteners and produce lactic acid, these are the uh, sausages that we want. Um, when we dry these sausages, uh, it's, it, we're still doing some of this stuff at a very low temperature. It's a longer process to make these slow fermenting sausages. Sometimes we want to get that pH down to four, six, where typically we're closer to seven in a lot of our fresh sausages. This is where we want to ferment it to get that sausage or that pH down there. We also want to get the water activity. That's what the AW means there. Um, if you're a chemistry person, Water activity has a big, long, you know, definition. Uh, in layman's terms, I like to just think of it as the amount of water available for bacterial growth. And you can see here, pure water has a water activity, obviously, of 0.99 to 1.0. Meat has a water activity of 0.97 to 0.98. So we're reducing that water activity quite a bit. You see 0.91 to 0.85. If we get that water activity down in that, area we're we're becoming a little bit more shelf state okay now obviously the lower the ph we got and the lower the water activity the more shelf stable that product becomes and just like these products get a lot of their flavor from not only the fermentation process but kind of like when we talk about country hams is that breaking down the proteins and fats that, that help with the flavor development as well the semi-dried uh, sausages, and probably one that you're most familiar with, are these summer sausages that we see around the holiday times. They're fermented, and but they're not fermented as a low pH as as the the dried sausages. So we're talking around five three. A lot of them are cooked, okay, uh, and so the cooking process stops the the fermentation uh, process. Water activity is a little bit higher on these, all right? So that, that's why they have a different mouthfeel. They're not shelf-stable, okay? Can we make these guys shelf-stable? Yeah, but we got to really add some solids in there. That's where the corn syrup solids come into play to drive that water activity down as well. And that's what you see in the, in the bottom category is the non-refrigerated semi-dried sausage. We're going to ferment them a little bit more. We're going to get that moisture to protein ratio down as well, okay? Um, I love this picture. I throw, use this picture in class. And the reason why I do this is we've been talking about these sausages. The one thing I have not discussed, and I see Dr. Morgan's on here, and she's going to love me for saying this. You're creating food. And we still have to keep attention and pay a close, close eye on food safety. All right. And that's why I say when we get into some of these, these other products, all right, these other sausages takes a different skill set. The semi-dried dried sausage, the fermented sausages, those are ready to eat product. I mean, I open up the package, I carve off a piece and I eat it. I don't have to cook it. And so in order to keep myself safe and my family safe and people around me safe that are consuming these, this is why the, the, the professionals that do these they go, th go through painstaking efforts to make sure that these products are safe for consumption. And here is a gentleman who is making sausage on a folding table next to his truck. Thank God he's got at least one latex glove on. It looks like he's got everything fastened down by the same clamps that he used probably for woodworking. And he's doing it inside a garage. And if you look out the window of the garage, it looks like it's a bright sunny day. It looks like it may be a little warm. I highly doubt that that uh, garage is, is refrigerated. So don't be like this guy. I realize that, well, I've never got sick before. I don't know how many times I've heard that. I must be doing something right. I've never got sick, all right? That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. And so we've got to make sure we're following 
uh, food safety uh, precautions here. But to continue on uh, this, this concept of the fermented sausages, again, the reason why we ferment them reduces the bacteria that's in there. Reason why we reduce the water activity reduces the bacteria in there. And so this is an old world uh, kind of nomenclature we call hurdle technology. How many hurdles can I put in front of those bacteria? Reducing the pH, that's one hurdle. Reducing the water activity, that's another hurdle that I put in front of those bacteria uh, to keep folks safe or you know, keep people safe from eating those products. In the old days when we made summer sausage, the summer sausage became very, the flavor became very distinct to the butcher shop that was making because the butcher shop or the person mixing it had their own kind of bacteria going around. And so that made that flavor very distinct, so much to the point where this is this practice that we refer to as back slopping. Some of you that maybe make bread will do the exact same thing where you keep a chunk of bread or dough from the previous batch to use it to inoculate the next batch, okay, with the yeast. Back slopping was a common thing. Problem of it is, is you keep back slopping so much, you, you get rid of the good bacteria and you got a lot more bad bacteria in there. And so people started to get sick in the 60s and 70s. So we've abandoned that back slopping uh, uh, practice and we utilize what's called a starter culture. And there's a variety of different starter cultures. Um, we obviously can't get into everything in, in, in an hour's time here. But we need to make sure when we're doing these starter cultures, we're using the right ones. Some of them are fast fermenters. Some of them are slow fermenters. Some are designed for dry cured sausages. Some are dry, designed for semi-dry sausages. And so you're going to have to do a little bit of research to make sure you're using the correct starter culture for your product that you're going to make. Um, and again, a lot of times these, these pHs on these products are, are, are uh controlled by the amount of sugar we found out and a lot of uh, other folks uh, uh, will back me up on this dextrose is a pretty sim simple sugar for these bacteria to uh to ferment and the longer or the more we add the longer time we add there in there it's a, able to reduce the ph and it takes some time to do these sausages all right this is why i say that it takes time takes some know-how now because it takes time uh, folks have gone to adding their own acid. So one of the things I haven't talked about is how that, if you've eaten a summer sausage, that tangy flavor that you get is caused by the acid that's in there, that tang uh, that you get. And so if that's all I'm looking for, I'm not looking to make it shelf stable. Um, maybe I add the acid to it to get that tangy flavor encapsulate citric acid we do that a lot down in the meat slab when we demonstrate these type of products we can use a, a variety of different products to add that acidic taste to it as well citric acid uh like i said earlier and so that's what i'm looking for now the problem of it is if i get a little heavy-handed on that i can create kind of a soft spongy watery sausage so you really got to watch uh the manufacturer suggested use for that product to make sure we don't overuse it in our in our sausages so enough about fermented sausage let's talk about the fun ones all right here's an emulsified sausage and you say what's a emulsified sausage well it's where i put two things together that really don't like each other and a common way of describing what an emulsion is if you look at italian dressing on the shelf it's separated in order to serve it i shake it up i've created an emulsion i put the the two things, the oil and water and, and vinegar and all that, they don't like each other, but if I mix them up, I create an emulsion. That's essentially what I've done with an emulsified sausage is I've taken that fat and suspended it into a water protein matrix, so I still have some juiciness to my product. Hot dogs are a classic example. Bologna is a classic example. Of a Cheese loaves. Sausage. Oh, and a pickle and loaf. So, uh, Apparently, yeah. Yeah. Pickle loaf, cheese loaf. There was one time there was even a macaroni and cheese loaf out there as well. And so that's why I say a lot of that product that you see on the pegboard in your in your grocery store meat case fall into this category as well. And so that begs the question, what are hot dogs really made of? It's just meat, folks. I've 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 heard the stuff of what they're made out of. Not really 
the case on this product. They're still made from just meat. Here's a fun one. Types of sausages. Uh, the last one we're going to go over is a specialty sausage. These are made from things that we don't normally think about eating on a regular basis. All right. Tongues, head meat, blood. And we make sausage out of it. And over the years, these, these were just considered poor people food. But over the years, things like tongue and blood sausage, head cheese, souse, they become kind of the, the uh, in thing to consume. Um, I can tell you right now, I've had tongue and blood sausage before. The best way I can describe flavor is if you go find the, the rusted shovel in your garage and lick it. That's about what that tastes like. Uh, but for some folks, they really enjoy this type of uh, product as well. And one I said is, is another one of those regional specialty sausages is Geta. Uh, we sit here in Lexington, we can get Geta as far south from Lexington, but it tends to be something that, that, that is mainly hubbed around Cincinnati. That's why right? well, it's called Cincinnati Caviar. That's why at one time yeah, Gleers had a Geta Fest. I don't know if they still do that or not. Uh, but it's an old German style sausage. And essentially, again, you will boil the meat off the bone. You would act, add ingredients to it like pin, uh, pinhead oaks, steel cut oaks. It's, it was a way of taking five pounds of meat and making 10 pounds of product out of his way of extending it. And it became its own flavor profile. I love Geta. I think it's great. Uh, my family loves Geta as well, but it's a very regional type product as well. And so it kind of shift gears a little bit here and talk about casings, all right? Uh, there's a variety of different casings out there. Cellulose. Uh, um, cellulose is an artificial casing. It, it's derived from plants. Wood pulp is mainly where it comes from. Uh, it's a, it, Most of these uh, cellulose casings are inedible. Is, does that mean if you eat it, is it going to hurt you? No. You're just going to pass through the system there. But they've gotten really uh, kind of... Uh, uh, advanced with these type of products they'll coat them with smoke they have a smoke flavor i've even seen where they've they've coated them with with logos where you can have your logo that once you peel that cellulose casing off there it's like an iron on but you have an old, old t-shirt and so on and so forth uh cellulose is 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 what a lot of folks use for uh, like hot dogs and so on and so forth uh and you're used for large sausages as well uh, then you get into collagens that you either get edible collagens or inedible collagens. Again, these are artificial uh, uh, casings. This usually is the is the connective tissue that they've scraped off from hide removal. So it is a byproduct of the leather industry. And a lot of folks will utilize the collagen casing because they're a little bit easier to use, a little bit more predictable to get a specific size out of them as well. Snack sticks, if you're into Slim Jims or any other kind of snack sticks, uh, sometimes you, you'll have some bratwurst that are made from collagen casings, smoked sausages that are made from collagen casings as well. And then obviously we've seen this many times is the plastic uh, casings. The, uh, obviously, shouldn't have to say this, they are inedible. The cool thing about the plastic casings, is, boy, I can put every logo I want on, or I can put my ingredients label on there, I can do anything. Challenges you can't see the actual product there, uh, but uh, the the plastic casing is usually just for a breakfast sausage or or a Mexican style chorizo. Then you get into the natural casings, and this is where a lot of people get a little bit squeamish on natural casings. Uh, this is where we utilize the uh, small and large intestines uh, mainly of the animal. Now you got to realize the small intestine, large intestine. There are three layers in there. They crush them, remove the outer and inner layer, and you're left with that middle layer. And that's what you utilize in, in natural casings. As many people that are turned off by the, by the concept of natural casings, there are a considerable number of people out there who will not consume it unless it is a natural casing. And so uh, a lot of your, your hardcore sausage makers are very, very much into the natural casings. And like I said, Usually the small and large intestine are used. We can use the stomach. We can use the bladder uh, and, and so on to make these. I think some of these are not legal to use anymore. I don't think beef bladders are legal to use anymore as well. So if I've inspired you, for some of you that are you're curious about making these products, um, how do I make it? Well, here's some 
basic ingredients that are basic ingredients. That's, that's where I know how to talk. Basic equipment you're going to need. You're going to need a grinder. Now, do you need to go down and go out and invest 10, 15, $20,000 in a grinder like I have down in the meat lab? No, you can, you can buy these at a smaller size at an economical price. Here's, I threw this in here for a reason. You know, you can get an attachment if you got a KitchenAid mixer, they can put a grinder on there as well. You're going to need some sort of mixing tubs. You're going to need a stuffer. And again, you can see this is a little bit more advanced stuffer where you fill it in here, uh, the meat inside this, this cylinder here, crank the handle and, and sausage comes out the horn right here. You're going to need ingredients, latex gloves, and I want you to be extremely clean. All right. And when I say if you're doing this at home and you're doing this in your kitchen, the dog, the cat, everybody needs to be out. OK, we're, again, we're making food, folks. I realize that, you know, sometimes, you know, we run into this as well. I'm making it home so I don't have to worry about food safety. No, that's probably where you really more need to learn about food safety, because the big plants where a lot of our food comes from, they're focused on food safety, whereas it's a, it's a little bit different for some of us in an at-home type thing. So I want you to be super de duper clean when you make these type of products. Uh, I know some of you are probably interested in this because of deer. Uh, I get a lot of phone calls from hunters that want to make this. I do I do a program in the uh, usually in the fall, early fall of food safety for hunters, and they want to know about this kind of stuff. And I throw deer in here, but you can throw any other kind of wildlife you have in there. And, you know, wildlife tends to be extremely lean, all right? We like the flavor of fat, and we want it to be juicy as well. And so we get a lot of that from uh, the water that we add in there. We get a lot of that from the fat that we in there to help with that juiciness. And so when you're making deer, a lot of folks that do this professionally, where you shoot a deer and you take it to a, a meat processor, they're going to add pork to it. You know, usually Boston butts that are fairly cheap. Fatty beef works as well as, as a way of, of, of adding some flavor to it, adding some uh, texture to it, adding some, some juiciness to the product as well. And you can see here's a jalapeno and cheddar summer sausage. Because like I showed you earlier in the picture from Minnesota, this is a special cheese that you see in here. And the reason why I say it's a special cheese, it's a what we call a high temperature cheese. You can't get this at Walmart. You can't get this at Kroger, IGA, Houchins, any grocery store that you go to. You usually have to order these products online. And what happens is we eat with our eyes. So if it has cheese in the title, I want to see cheese in the product. Typically, if we're using just their store-bought cheese, it's going to melt. And you're not going to get that particle definition that you see in there, all right? And because we eat for our eyes, we want to make sure that we can see the cheese in there. So we use a high temperature cheese. The other thing that helps us is a lot of times your store-bought cheeses, when they melt and then they re-solidify, they get a bit of a sour flavor to them as well. This eliminates that. And you can go online. There's a variety of cheddar. There's a habanero jack. There's a pepper jack. There's a Swiss and so on and so forth. So about any variety of cheese you can think of, they make a high temperature version of it as well. I've gotten this question for a lot of times early on with, with hunters that have done this. They, they want to use jalapenos. They want that jalapeno and cheddar summer sausage. And then they go out and they buy fresh jalapenos or they buy pickled jalapenos. Those products are way too acidic. And so you're not going to get your sausage to bind very well. And so you need to make sure you're using a dried jalapeno. And that will help your sausage stay together using a dried jalapeno. Um, just a word of caution, when you're scooping out dried jalapenos, Try not to breathe at the same time you're doing that. It will get in your throat and really irritate you. To be, I'll never forget one time we ordered a big 50-pound uh, box of dried jalapenos, and they delivered it to the grad student office here on the second floor on a Friday afternoon, and nobody was in there. They just shoved the box in there. They really had to let that room air out on Monday so they could uh, have it to, you know, uh, get in there and, and, and work because it, it really kind of aerosoled in there as an irritant as well. So where do I find this stuff? Uh, one uh, website, I don't get, I'm not affiliated with these folks, but 
I like this website because this website is designed for the do-it-yourselfer, and that's SausageMaker.com. You can buy grinders. You can buy little bitty smokehouses, so you don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a big industrial smokehouse. You can buy little bitty ones to do that from SausageMaker.com. You can buy pre-mixed sausages, seasonings in there as well. Um, other Some of this other equipment, uh, Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops. Uh, it's been a few months since I've been to Cabela's here in Lexington, but I can remember being in there. They had a variety of these grinders and mixers and stuffers and stuff like that, even the pre-blended seasonings and so on and so forth. Uh, Amazon, I think if it's if it exists in this world, it probably can be found on Amazon. Uh, you'll find out when you uh, go making sausage that when you start buying ingredients, the different seasonings to put together, it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. And so what a lot of folks do is buy a pre-blend sausage from AC Leg, Excalibur, or SausageMaker.com. Uh, you can go to Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops and buy this pre-blended se sausage seasoning as well. Uh, they even have stuff to make uh, the summer sausages. I will say this. You need to make sure you have everything, uh, all the equipment you need. If it says add a teaspoon for 25 pounds of meat, make sure you're actually measuring out a teaspoon and it actually is 25 pounds of meat. Just don't do the TV chef's thing and say, oh, that's a teaspoon. That looks like 25 pounds of meat because some of these products, especially the nitrite, can be pretty damaging if we misuse it and we can cause serious uh, harm to human health. And like I say, you know, start off easy. If you're doing this at home or you're, you're a homesteader, do it yourself or start off easy with a fresh sausage, learn how to do that, and then gradually uh, work yourself up to some of the more uh, complicated sausages and always ask for help. We're always here for help here at UK, either myself or somebody, some of the other folks from the uh, Food Systems Innovation Center, we're here to help you. I got to put the plug in, all right, folks. These products that you're making at home, you cannot legally sell these products, all right? You have to be USDA inspected and all this stuff in order to sell it, okay? So don't do like uh, uh, Kramer and Newman here in, in the kitchen and making a lot of sausage and think you can go sell that at the farmer's market. No, you cannot. That is illegal to do that. You need to make sure you're doing that. Uh, if you want to sell this, that you're you're working with a USDA inspected process and they're doing that for you. With that being said, I got to give a plug. If you're really interested in, in this and you uh, want a little bit more hands-on experience, I received a grant uh, to teach this. We're having an upcoming process meats clinic where we go over a lot of these these sausages that we talked about, as well as how to make bacon and hams as well. It's a free workshop because I've got it through a grant to pay for everything. Um, June 13th, we're doing one for the extension uh, personnel that we have out there. June 14th is for meat processors in the public. Feel free to send me an email to get registered for the June 14th one. It's a day-long workshop. And with that, uh, any questions any, anybody has? And a hush fell over the crowd. See, we have some chat up here. No questions on the chat. All right. Questions? It sounds like we don't have any questions. Uh, folks, thank you so much for uh, joining us for these virtual office hours. Uh, these are always kind of fun to do. Uh, I appreciate folks uh, chiming on there. If for some reason when we uh, log off of here, if you have a, uh, a question, feel free to email me on this. Uh, on this. Uh, if you, uh, this water, oh, here we got one. Does waterfowl work for sausage? It can, it requires a little bit more know-how uh, to do waterfowl for, for sausage. It'd be kind of the same for doing um, um, like a chicken sausage or a turkey sausage or something along those lines. Uh, the problem with, I see, and we were talking about this earlier today with chicken sausage and the poultry sausages is, is making sure we have some sort of fat or flavoring in there or something water holding to get in there so that uh, 
uh, we don't have a dry sausage. You're not just making uh, seasoned sawdust. So yeah. Other questions? All right, folks, like I said, have any other questions that, that strike you as we leave? Uh, feel free to email me and we will uh, see some of you folks. If you're interested in the Process Meets Clinic, let me know and we'll get you registered. So if not, take care.